FinTech space, along with many other spaces these days, is getting an extraordinary amount of attention. And I think it's a, important for us to sit here and start to hash out some of the issues with you because it's a, a very complex space at the same time. Last night in discussions and yesterday in discussions uh, around the topic of FinTech, we heard people asking about the regulatory structure, about who the investors are about whether it's truly an international landscape, uh, about how things will play out competitively. And uh, you can see there's just a, a lot of discussion that needs to go around these things. Statistically, we've seen probably uh, four times as much money flow in in the last three years into FinTech as we have seen flow into the venture capital industry overall. But at the same time, the failure rate for FinTech has almost been twice as high as all other industries in terms of a monetization. So this is a space that is new. It's a space that is in flux. And it's a space that needs some uh, more identifiable pathway for, I think, a lot more people to be able to join and, and get along with the party. So with that as a, as a quick intro, why don't we, uh, maybe I could quickly profile the two gentlemen uh, that were up here on stage with, because I don't know that they'll do it justice themselves. They'll probably just give you the short shrift. We'll start with Jim, because his list uh, appears to be the longest by, by a line or two. Uh, very quickly, uh, and, and I'll move from recent history back, but Jim is the managing director of 630, uh, which is a fintech accelerator and investor, which he founded in 2013. He's the founder and general partner of Cultivation Capital. He's the co-founder of Third Degree Glass Factory, advisor to Cabbage, to Locker Dome, Co-founded Square, of course, which uh, many of us has watched them on Bloomberg and relative, uh, <laughs> relative public life, commenting on that. And he founded Mirror Digital Publishing, and he uh, is a graduate from Washington University in St. Louis. Mr. Bhatia, as I have to call him, is uh, a Singapore colleague of mine and an industry colleague of mine. I was at Morgan Stanley for many years, and I knew Bobby from J.P. Morgan Chase Partners, I knew him from AIG Capital. Uh, he's, of course, most recently the founder of Track Invest, a fintech company which he'll be sharing some thoughts with, uh, with, with us today on, and uh, a very long-standing professional in the financial services industry. So with that as a background, let's try to get some insights. Let's try to understand how not only to disrupt in fintech, but hopefully to succeed in fintech. And we'll turn it to these two gentlemen with a, a series of questions, if that's OK. Now, starting out, before we get into all the issues, maybe just on a personal level, Jim and Bobby, we can have both of you just comment on the backgrounds that I've just shared with the, with the room. A lot of people believe getting into business that you need to be really focused on something to do well, but yet you guys show up with all sorts of diversified background and experience here, some of it seeming to head in different directions. Do you want to just make an opening comment about how your own personal backgrounds being either diversified or focused have helped you to succeed or start succeeding in fintech? So I sort of illustrate lack of focus in my resume, but understand that that's over 25 years. So typically what happens in my case is I focus very, very strongly at one time on one problem. And um, my MO is pretty simple. I look at a problem. Um, it has to be something I care about. So it's not money or it's not just to um, you know, have my name on a company or anything, there's something that has to piss me off, okay? Um, fortunately, a lot of things do, right? And um, once I've got something that I focus on, uh, then uh, pretty much everything else stops, and I work on that. But uh, I'm, I'm a lousy manager, so I always look at the beginning for a way to uh, collect around me people who are very organized, very uh, able to do the things that I'm not able to do. So after a while, um, I get to the point where the people around me are able to do the task of the organization better than I, uh, and then I get out and start something else. Bobby? Yeah, I, th I think um, I'll second that. I think for me also, the key about focus um, has always been is focusing on one problem at one time. I think the main experience I can talk about 
on fintech side for me has been that I've actually, the time I've actually spent in the actual old world industry. So as I spent in banks or in brokerage companies, et cetera, and understanding the old systems first. Only then was I able to actually think about creating new systems and focusing on new systems. Thanks. So let's get right to the elephant in the room. As exciting as this space may be, I think all of us know, and these gentlemen more than most, this is an industry that is heavily regulated. So as we go forth and try to be inventive or, or disruptive, how is the average entrepreneur supposed to face up to this morass of regulation? And in fact, Jim, if you don't mind, you shared a good story backstage, which maybe you can share here. Your technology at Square was up and ready and running in three weeks. You were moving money, per se, but it took a year and a half to start to deal with some of the regulatory code out there. Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty terrible ratio. Um, so Jack and I had uh, the original uh, product for Square working, um, including the hardware, within three weeks. And then it took us 18 months to get uh, proper regulatory compliance with uh, a bunch of different groups in the ecosystem. We, so we had uh, government requirements uh, for money transmission. We had uh, uh, requirements with banks and uh, you know capital requirements. And then we had to negotiate with each uh, entity in the case of uh, you know the Visa and MasterCard and American Express and all those guys. So it was a mess. Uh, one of the things that I think really helped us was that we built the product first. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the financial technology industry in general is that it's not terribly creative. And, and it's, it's not surprising to think about that because if you think about, the, you know, the purpose of a bank is to not have money stolen, right? Like, if you have a bank, your main job is to just not get ripped off. Um, so over time, what happens is the DNA of these organizations tend to become very conservative. You hire people who are good accountants, who are careful people who don't get their pockets picked. Um, but then over time, that organization sort of loses its edge. So one of the things that we did at Square um, was, you know, sort of in contrast to what Bobby said, I was totally ignorant about the financial space. I just knew what I wanted to do, and I didn't know how difficult it was. So I just set off and I built it. And then when we, we built it, we sort of hacked this thing together that was actually moving money. And when we wanted to convince somebody to let us play, uh, we would go take money from them. So the, the way it would go like this is I say, hey, I've got this really cool thing I got to show you. Give me your credit card. And then I take money away from and you know, take the credit card. I say, okay, I just took 20 bucks. <laughs> go check your bank. And so that sort of demonstration got us the attention uh, that we would not have otherwise been able to get by just, you know, firing off uh, meeting requests to uh, Visa, MasterCard, and the banks. You won't be taking credit cards here today, will you? I can't. I have the technology. <laughs> well, at least Jim can claim ignorance when he embarked on his challenge at Square, but Bobby, you can't. You're well familiar with the regulatory structure of this industry. When you left your big bank existence, why would you dare try to go against that in creating Track Invest and doing the work you're doing now? Well, I think, I think when I started creating Track Invest, first was actually why I was creating Track Invest and what the intent is. And I think when you're looking at fintech, you have to actually clearly define what the intent is. Am I doing it for profit? Am I doing it for, um, to democratize information? Am I doing it for transparency? For Track Invest, for, for me, what was important was to actually try to bring accountability and transparency that existed or sometimes did not exist at the institutional level down to the retail level. So we actually said, hey, listen, if you want to be a broker, you're going to actually maintain your track record and you're going to share that with other people. Now, when it comes down to coming back to your subject about the regulatory environment, et cetera, I think in fintech, I think, I think the regulators, by not regulating over the past few years, have played a large part in this acceleration of financial technology. I don't think that this would have happened if we did not have like, the, um, the financial recession that actually happened or the, the events that happened in actually 2009. I think certain events and, and certain failures in the existing system I think the regulators taking a more lenient view at this moment towards alternative sources of capital and alternative structures has created these new fintech companies. But I think moving forward, what people have to be very, very careful about, or people who are in the fintech space, is to be very careful that once you get big enough, once there's a scandal, once there's a failure, and, and be ready that this industry will be regulated, uh, just like any other industry. Because you know, at the front end, 
you know, let's say in a financial technology company, you are now allowing peer-to-peer -peer lending. Now, this peer-to-peer -peer lending is just creating a better user experience for you uh, on, on the internet or on the mobile. Um, it's actually transferring the technology savings back to you. It's a better user experience. But guess what? When it gets bigger, you're still going to be looking at risk. You're still looking at underwriting standards that are pretty much the industry standard today. And once you start doing that in a bigger manner, you'll be regulated. So just staying with this topic for a minute, and I'm going to ask you both one more comment. Jim, as you're looking at investments going forward in fintech, will you invest in things that are bumping up against obvious regulatory barriers? Will you encourage that and say, keep plugging through, we'll break that down later? Or do you recognize it's a real investment constraint and, and thus too risky? So I have the um, experience of seeing regulations fall. Right? I remember the uh, head of MasterCard looking at the first Square demo that we did. Uh, and he turned to me and he said, do you realize that breaks our acquiring rules? And I said, yes. And there was a moment of silence and he said, so I guess we have to change them. <laughs> you know, he, it could have gone the other way and I wouldn't be sitting here, right? Um, but my experience is that, you know, if there's true value in what you are creating, um, these people are not unreasonable. They're just conservative. And they're conservative for good reasons. So as long as you're respectful and you're offering a true solution, um, then I think you can get it through. And I'm, a, I'm an optimist when it comes to if the people are willing to change things uh, to create better systems. Okay. And, and part of the reason I'm touching on this again is to hear that. But also, Bob, you mentioned something last night at dinner, which is you know, fintech is not only about breaking rules and setting new standards. Sometimes it's really about, like with Apple's recent release of, of Apple Pay, maybe co-opting an existing system. We saw it with music, too. Do you feel that way about fintech, that this is really more about using what exists and just improving it, either on a cost basis or price basis? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think, I think that's why I always get a little bit nervous when, when people say, oh, disrupting financial technology will disrupt. Now, these are systems that have been in place for a very, very long time. They're very established. They're very embedded in our culture, in our, in our society. So I think it's very important that to, if you're going to go in the fintech space, you can actually accelerate your growth. You can accelerate your adoption if you take uh, the word use co-opt or, or a collaborative approach. So even for something like us, for Track Invest, it's really been about us on the flip side reaching out to um, uh, brokerage firms, uh, stock exchanges, the regulators, telling them what we're doing, why we're doing it, if the intent being that this is going to help people in the retail community not get ripped off, getting their buy-in and working with them. Because I, I truly believe that you know, you're, by, by collaborating with those existing institutions, you know, call it disruption, call it, uh, call it improvement, call it whatever. Uh, I think that's, that's the way to go. Okay, so with regulations out there, and now we've talked about how to deal with these things or ignore them or, or, or break them, uh, getting to business, Jim, you've said publicly, so everybody knows you've got to have a product, you've got to have a team, you've got to have money. But in fintech, you're a big believer that you have to have yourself or through someone like 630, for instance, access. You need connectivity to business. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so that's absolutely true. Um, most companies will succeed if they have a great team, a great product, and enough money to get over the finish line, okay? But if you're a fintech company, those are not sufficient. You need also access to the rails. So the great example of Square was that we didn't have access to the rails for a year and a half, and um, partially because we had to forge all these new relationships. Well, it turns out that that can be accelerated. So what, um, uh, what we do at 630 is very simple. If you've got a fintech company, um, we happen to have a large number of, of financial service companies in my hometown of St. Louis. It's actually the number two concentration in the United States behind New York. And so we have already made relationships with all these organizations. So if you need an insurance company, well, we have the largest insurance company in the country. If you need a bank, we have 10 banks that are headquartered there. If you need MasterCard, well, MasterCard's got you know, more employees there than any place else. So what we're able to do is play, basically play matchmaker to the fintech companies that, uh, that need those relationships. And once those relationships are in place, then the innovation can occur. And Bobby, is that your experience as well? We congratulate you for your innovation at Track Invest, but can you share with us how you guys have almost done the same thing in ensuring your connectivity with stock exchanges, commerce, corporations, 
almost from day one. So, Jim already touched on the connectivity point. So, you know, the, the, the key to my connectivity with all of these guys was that I actually spent 25 years in the industry. That was one component of it. But I, the other components, actually, the team that we've actually put together, the people we put together, the, the senior management of what I would call Track Invest, uh, the top five people are people who have anywhere from 15 to 25 years of industry experience. So that combined with technology talent is basically what's actually helping us uh, build this business. I always keep telling people, I said, yeah, it, Track Invest is an online business that's being built offline. Most of my meetings, most of the things that I do, and most of the things that make this business model defensible are actually done offline in terms of relationships with institutions who will then help you grow in, in, in the various markets. Going forward, when we are looking at companies, whether you're looking as an accelerator, you're going to make an investment, or whether we're just meeting people in the room and we're mentoring, obviously the earlier stage the company's at, the harder it is to, to see the future. And, and the more confidence and dependability we get as, as the company builds out. Should we be thinking that way? Should, when I'm looking at companies, should I be looking for a competitive, sustainable advantage? Or is that not the way to approach FinTech? We're really looking for innovation that, that can flower. So I can only speak for my own bias here. Um, a lot of the fintech companies I look at, I really just don't care about. You know, they, they sit there and say, well, we're going to exploit this little thing over here that, uh, you know, some form of arbitrage or something. It's just trivial and not worth it. Um, the ones that I get excited about are ones that bring uh, access to more people, uh, the ones that bring transparency. If, if you're solving a, me a meaningful problem, um, then I'm interested. Uh, but if you're just, you know, you just got a way to sort of, you know, wring some money out of a system, fi fine, go do it somewhere else. And when you set this up, Track Invest, did you feel that you had immediately established some kind of sustainable competitive advantage, or, or it's, it's not working that way? Well, I mean, when I set some, something up like Track Invest, we had a thesis and we were trying to address a very specific problem. Um, today, the company has Thomson Reuters. Uh, Relegare as partners. Relegare is a company in India that has a million retail customers. You have Singapore Press Holdings. So for us, uh, the real testament to what we were trying to do was the actual buy-in of these companies. And these all happen once again through these offline meetings and, and, and through uh, helping people understand what we were trying to address, how we were trying to address it, and in a collaborative manner. In this scenario where there's so much uh, origination going on here and we don't care about half the stuff that's happening, people are rolling stuff out all over the map and we're going to concentrate on our bits, is the consumer ultimately really benefiting or are they being subject to what is a tremendous amount of invention in the industry and they're just going to have to suffer through it until there are standards and more of a, a followable path for them? You know, I think, I think you're going to see consumer benefit probably as a tertiary effect. Most people don't get up there and say, well, our mission is to, you know, help people. Um, and, um, and that's okay. But in general, you have a shifting uh, ecosystem right now because these days, information is more freely available. So abuse is harder to hide. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, that we've seen uh, certainly through the Square experience and also through some of the things we're doing at 630 is once a good idea is out, uh, it's then harder to rip people off with a bad idea. So, uh, you know, the classic example is I just, uh, you know, talked to a merchant who was paying 7% to take credit cards. And you would think, well, that's insane. You know, 3% is excessive, but 7%, it turns out it happens a lot. Um, but it's just buried in all these, you know, ob obfuscating la layers of, you know, fees and, uh, you know, extra compliance uh, uh, tithings. And, and those just ultimately added up to 7%. And so if you, if you, look at sort of the general trend of the world, it's easier to communicate and it's harder to hide abuse. So that's a good thing. And maybe you want to touch on then all those points. Are you benefiting the consumer? Are you bringing new transparency? Are you providing better security? I, th I think you are, but it takes time. Um, you know, it's kind of like that old Sufi point, God is trying to sell you something, but you don't want to buy, right? Because if it's new, I'm not sure, you know, there's a certain level of mistrust or distrust. And, and even as we have gone along and gotten buy-ins from different corporates, et cetera, even from a consumer, 
they're like, well, why does this work? Or how will I benefit from this? Or how do I know this is real? Um, so I think it's, 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 it's a slow process. Um, when it comes down to actual, the better? OK. All right. So when it, when it comes down to actual um, consumer, uh, it, it takes time for the adoption. It takes time for people to understand the value. Uh, and obviously, you're also working in an environment where regulations can change. I mean, and I can only talk in context of Asia. Um, you know, you have countries that have monopolistic businesses or duopolies where they're extremely threatened uh, because, you know, this new technology is going to come and eat away my profit. So I think, the con well, absolutely the consumer will benefit, but I think the system will also define how quickly the adoption is um, and and how how much how much does the system actually support the adoption and, and, the, uh, and, and propagation of that? Fintech? Is FinTech thus far a, a local game? Or are you learning from the global lessons that are out there, from the kind of work Jim has done or others have done around the world? I think, I th I think different things are happening in different environments. I think, obviously, the US has been way more advanced than, than anybody else in, in leading the models. Um, Asia has had the benefit, like, you know, for example, if you look at telecom. So we actually never had. Uh, uh, the same, you know, or, or, or the telecom infrastructure that we built was the new one. So that's why sometimes you almost feel that, you know, using a telephone or a cell phone in Asia is so much better than actually using it in the U.S. So in many ways that we've actually not had legacy systems um, that we have to recreate or, or, or rework. So in many of these markets, we're actually seeing a different style, which is, you know, from day one, we're going to actually build something new. And, and why not being from the industry, Jim, and with you already having a lot of commitments out there, I think you said you have five companies and you have a speaking schedule, et cetera, et cetera. Why did you decide to set up 630 to concentrate on fintech versus all the other big spaces out there still to be disrupted? Well, um, so I'm a big booster of my hometown, which is this little place called St. Louis, Missouri. Most of you have probably not heard of it, but um, it's where I'm from, and uh, it needs some help. And one of the things that I know how to do is start companies. And so the thing that I was looking for, so I always like to have an unfair advantage when I do something. And I don't want, I don't want to just play on a level playing field. I want to have as many uh, advantages as I can. And one of the things that's hard to copy is an industrial base, right? So um, the only city that's really in the running to compete with St. Louis on this uh, area is New York. And they actually have a financial technology accelerator. We, we actually work with them. So, so you know, you can go to New York, you can go to St. Louis. Um, and it was just a natural thing that we could exploit that other cities didn't have. Um, and also, it was a personal thing because I'd had my experience with Square. And I thought, well, it would have been very useful for me to have this tool back five years ago when I was starting Square. And similar question to you, Bobby. Now that you're on this path, are you finding yourself and Track Invest wanting to continue innovating in the financial space, or are you staying on a, a narrow focus path? No, no, absolutely. So our, our focus is continue to uh, continue to focus on this. As a result, you know, we have people working on the big data and the analytics and predictive analytics that will be coming out in the next six months. And, you know, just like St. Louis, we, we, I live in a smaller city than St. Louis called Singapore, and that's been a, a great, great place for us to uh, base ourselves out of because it's actually one of the key financial hubs. I mean, Singapore, being a small country, it's you know, akin to, say, a Switzerland or a Geneva or Zurich, where you, know, you have a huge amount of private banking capital. You have a huge banking infrastructure. This is a city that gives you full connectivity into, for example, where my team is, which is in India, into, you know, I can fly to 10 different cities in India directly from Singapore. Um, and also gives you a full connectivity into the Asia region, where you know, between Indonesia, Southeast Asia and, and India, you're talking about 55% of the world's population. And, and Bobby, given that you have a long history in Asia, and since we're in Korea right now, maybe you could just comment further on how ready do you think Asian fintech is ready to innovate and develop and progress? Do you think Korea is well-placed to do this? Do you think it's going to happen in Singapore or Hong Kong? I saw a UK bankers poll that said in the next 10 years, what will be the financial center of the world, if we had to guess? And the answer was Singapore slash Hong Kong, uh, ahead of London. That would be interesting. Do you think Asia is poised to really move ahead in the fintech world? Uh, absolutely. I think, I think Asia is poised to move ahead in fintech world. I think um, 
we have not heard about many of these institutions that I've been meeting that you will probably hear about in the next three to six months. Uh, as a matter of fact, just yesterday I met, uh, before I got the flight here, I met with a company in Singapore that's raised a billion dollars to do FinTech. Um, you know, and this is money coming from family offices in Europe. And to owns, invest. To invest, yeah. Um, and it's family offices in Europe and Middle East. And when I actually went through, they have 10 companies in their portfolio already, uh, and they're making a meaningful impact. One of the companies is called Apex Peak that's doing, basically what it's doing is it's, it's an online receivable factoring model. So basically if you have a receivable that you have to receive from somebody, you know, we will for a fee, we'll actually give you the money and we'll take that receivable and we'll factor it for you. That company, as I looked at the numbers, did a billion dollar worth of transactions. We actually haven't really heard about it yet. Um, and I, I, I turned around to them and I said, do you have any PR? I said, how, how come I haven't heard about you guys? They said, well, you know, it, it actually made sense for us to be under the radar, coming back again to the same point that I was making earlier, is a lot of the CEOs in this business realize that if you start messing with other people's profit, um, and you're effectively getting into the lending business or factoring business, say, without a banking license, without an NBFC or non-banking financial services license, if you're getting too big, you know, somebody's going to come and, 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 uh, and regulate you. So as a result, a lot of these companies you haven't heard about because they're operating literally under the radar. You know, as we're talking about this, too, we realize when we keep saying fintech, fintech, there's a whole bunch of elements that, of course, can make people interesting or, or exciting or successful. We're talking about things like social interaction, gamification. Are you looking for all elements of a solution when you're looking at fintech plays? Um, I'm looking at the efficacy of the solution. So if a game is good, that's great. Because you know, it, it tends to be kind of boring, uh, just moving money around. And if you can make it fun, that's great. If you can make the experience special in some way, you know, that's, that's a natural advantage. So, yeah, we try to consider the whole ecosystem. But, you know, the fintech world is just ripe for innovation because it is something that touches our lives on a daily basis. So it's a really great place to be right now. And, Bobby, I would say the same thing. When you set out to establish Track Invest, where you, you obviously have a social element to your game, maybe you can make a quick comment about that, and a gamification element. Was this a, a comprehensive solution you were trying to provide, or did, did the industry just demand that? I, I, think, I think you start with a thesis. You start building it. As you go through the process, you enhance the product because you learn from what the industry wants. So I think it was a combination of that we had a general direction and a general view, uh, or we had, we had established what we felt was the problem. Uh, and I think as we went along the process, we're getting educated every day on as, how to enhance it. So whether we have to bring in the social element or we have to bring in the gamification element, you know, that's what we do. Okay. We're only having a few minutes left, so let me just get to a, a big question that some people last night made sure I asked Jim. What are you seeing now in fintech that excites you? <laughs> the next wave. You know, um, I, I think the cryptocurrencies are going to be big because they have the ability to enable microtransactions, which has been a source of great friction in the economy. Is that exciting? <laughs> I mean, it's an honest answer. I think that's where the stuff's going, and I would love to be able to do these, like, little tiny transactions. I would love to be able to efficiently move money around, um, you know, but... Right now, we don't have an efficient means of doing that. And I think as an economist, so I was trained as an economist, um, I think enabling that will be very interesting if you're an economist. <laughs> but uh, it's not a good answer to give from stage. <laughs> well, stay away from the economist yeah. bit. That won't be exciting. Bobby, what excites you now in fintech? When you look, when you read, when you meet people, are there areas that you're being drawn to already and you think the audience should be well aware of? Yeah, I think. One thing I will say, fintech is a very, very broad word. So fintech is not, you know, micropayments. It's not only the insurance industry. It's not the banking industry, the brokerage. It's, it's, it's everywhere, wherever you see money and the movement of money, uh, it's that. And it's basically trying to look at doing that transaction, um, you know, from a consumer side, from a delivery side, in just a better and a more efficient manner. Um, what excites me, and I think what also 
the fintech companies have figured out, which you know, some of the banks have not done for a very, very long time, is the way you build defensibility into this model is by focusing on the big data aspects, right? So if, if for example, if we've actually gamified something, um, we're able to now collect trading data, even though it's gamified and virtual data, but we've actually put in certain things in there, but we're able to collect that and we're starting to look at um, user behavior, right? Uh, people are actually looking in the insurance industry and saying, hey, listen, we have a mobile today. We can actually figure out how fast you're going, how slow you're going, and, and how much you're traveling. So because you're not on the card that often and you don't drive that fast, maybe your insurance premium should be less. So I think what's exciting to me is basically the data and the big data and being able to process that and, and translate that saving back to the customer. That's exciting for me. Good. Thank you both. We're good. We're going to have to wrap up, but before we do, why don't we just check quickly in the audience and see if there are a couple of questions. I'll also give you a quick heads up. Jim will be around for about one more hour after we get off the stage, so you can grab him. Bobby will be around all day, so you'll have a fair chance. Any questions? Oh, I see a hand over there. I don't know if we have a microphone. Yeah, so I really, yeah, I'm just speaking personally, not on behalf of uh, Square or anybody, but, you know, I think it's great, right? I want to see the more, dis I, I want to see as much chaos in the industry as possible, okay? I want to see as much stuff happening, and that's partially for selfish reasons, because I, you know, work for a small company with a lot of smart people, and they tend to out-innovate. So in an environment where everything is changing and being disrupted and, you know, it's chaos, um, that favors the small, nimble entrance. And so uh, I think it's great. Now, uh, what's actually going to happen? Eh, you know, going to be a good, good match. Uh, there's uh, very powerful forces um, on both sides. And uh, it'll be fun to watch them fight and, uh, you know, maybe join in a little bit. Do you want to comment, Bobby? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Apple is one, but Facebook is also getting into the asset management business. Um, I disagree with Jim on one point. You know, I've, I've been through the 88, 98, 2008 crashes, so I actually think we have enough chaos in the industry. <laughs> so, so I think, I think, I think, but, 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 you know, all jokes aside, I think, I think Jim's point is right that that new entrants are figuring out new approaches to old problems, right? And more people and the more minds and the more companies you have doing that, you know, we might actually get a fresh approach out of it. I'm not sure. Thanks for the question. Any others? Every day, Jim. I mean, yeah, privacy is a big deal, but um, it's almost so big a deal that it's a so what. I mean, yeah, don't lose people's personal information. Duh. You know. Now, if you want to get beyond that, what's what's interesting, I think, about privacy is how freely we give up a lot of this information. So I will happily reveal my personal information if uh, somebody gives me even this sort of infinitesimal value, um, and I think that's going to change over time. And again, I'm very interested in seeing how. Uh, the world of micropayments uh, evolves in parallel with privacy because, you know, I might be willing to sell some of my data uh, if it was easy for me to do in a sort of frictionless way, um, you know, th the same way I'll sell my attention. So I'll uh, give you a great example. I'm going to be sitting in an airport uh, this afternoon, and um, in uh, the United States, I, uh, I occasionally watch TV. Okay, so what would be cool? It would be cool for me to be able to watch the TV ads that they're going to force me to watch anyway during my favorite programs in the airport here when I got free time. And I'll watch the ads and I'll take a quiz on that. And if that could be enabled by a micropayment, um, actually one of the companies I was working with um, had a, uh, a virtual currency that was used to address some of these issues. And I think, I think that's a super interesting area because, uh, and, and it gets back to privacy because, you know, ultimately your data is extremely valuable to these companies, especially when aggregated. Um, but the question is who owns that data? And every consumer feels that it's their data, but in fact it's data. So 
lots of people can have their hands on it. It's going to be a real mess. Before Bobby answers, let me add a little heat. If you experience uh, privacy lapses and you lose data, does that actually imperil your business? Uh, yeah, so I think, I think one is privacy aspect of somebody coming in, hacking, and, and, and stealing your data. The other one is the company who's actually collecting your data behaving in an unethical manner, right? So let's take a step back and, and talk about not the fintech companies, uh, but also talk about, say, somebody like Bloomberg. So Bloomberg provides you with financial information. Uh, what happened a few years ago was that people, traders, who were entering yeah. trades or they were, right? Oh, so, yeah. yeah, they were entering their trades or they were just looking up stock. Bloomberg figured out this really smart way and said, hey, you know what? A thousand people in the last one minute bought Apple stock. Something is going on. Let's buy Apple stock. So I think... I think there's a question of privacy, uh, agreed, but I think there's also a question of ethics and that, you know, whether it's a fintech company, it's a new world company, it's an old world company, that's defined by the management and that's defined. And I think over time, you are gonna have issues with this and I think that will lead to regulation of some sort. But I think if we, as a fintech community, uh, take a concerted effort to, to protect against that, uh, I, think, I think everybody benefits. Okay, why don't we stop it there? But like I said, the gentleman around for another hour, I would encourage you to hear some of his stories. He's got some great stories. Bobby as well. Thanks very much.